Well, again, thank you, everybody. I'm Dirk Falter, and um, with Buckeye Woodworkers and Wood Turners, for anybody that's not familiar, that's the group located down south, just south of Akron and Green. And we meet the second Saturday of the month, so next week, if anybody's interested in the Buckeye Turning, uh, it's next week. Uh, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about pepper mills. I'm going to do a, a different one, what I call a, a different twist on, a, on the same grind. These are, I'll pass one in each direction. One's a salt shaker, one's a pepper mill. It's a three-sided pepper mill uh, with a twist to it. And uh, you can do it either direction, doesn't matter. Uh, depending on how we line it up, uh, we can rotate it so it'll go left to right or right to left. Uh, this one's a grinding one. This one, I think I lost the sound. Maybe not. Uh, this one's a pepper shaker. Uh, I've used the crush grind mill. I'll explain that in a little bit of detail, but uh, this will be what the, somewhat close to what we'll end up at the end of the day. You don't have to worry about the tops for those. So what will happen is you can do whatever kind of design you want in the direct into the top. Uh, you're not worried about a, a mechanism on these for anybody that's new to pepper mills. The uh, adjustment's all in the bottom. It's an insert, and I've got a couple inserts. Uh, you can see, we can pass these around so you can get an idea. This is what the insert will look like. Again, it's a ceramic insert uh, with plastics. Uh, one goes into the top. I'll explain that a little bit. And uh, you can grind anything that's a grindable spice. Uh, in the crush grind pepper mills, uh, and also if somebody's looking for some books, I've got a few just for examples. There's a couple of good ones by Chris West if anybody's looking for ideas on how to make a pepper mill or salt, salt shaker. Uh, he's got a couple different books really on that one. Uh, in offset wood turning, uh, anybody, again, this is part of multi-axis turning. Barbara Dill's got a nice little book that she makes. Uh, she's got a lot of web stuff on there. Esculon is another person that you could look at for offset. Uh, he's, if anybody's familiar with the, the tremblers that he created, these long 1.8 millimeter diameter sticks that will just wobble in any direction. Uh, he's done some of those things and quite a few other things in offset. So there's quite a bit of literature on it. Um, and there may even be some in your library on some of that as well. I'll spend just a couple minutes on the crush grind. Uh, what you need, there's about five drill bits you need to do that for making a crush grind mechanism, uh, depending on how you do it. I always turn a, a spigot in the top, and I create the space for that as well as for the insert. So you need a 7 8 inch drill to drill inside to handle the top insert. Uh, which would be uh, this piece that you're drilling for to fit in. Uh, you need a one inch one, which you're going to do for the center of your hole. So when you go down through the center of your, your mill, it'll be a one inch hole generally through the center of it. Uh, I like to have some of them fairly tight diameters uh, just because when you get into the neck, it makes it much easier for somebody to hold on to. So that's always something to consider, who has to hold on to it. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to turn it. And then you'll have a, a one and a quarter inch one. If you're doing a spigot that you're going to have your insert, you'll need a one, basically a one and a quarter inch spigot that's going to turn in to uh, mate in your inside hole here so the two can go together. And then for the actual mechanism itself, you'll need two different types. This is a one and a half inch diameter that you can use and then to actually get your hands down into there, it's a one and three quarter inch diameter, and you'll see in the bottom of that, that'll help with the, uh, just give a little more space there. Something to consider is how you want to design a pepper mill, and it's much easier to spend a little time on paper thinking about your design than actually at the lathe, because it's always easier to make and erase lines than it is to put the wood back on. Uh, so if I've got my pepper mill block and I've got it spaced out, I'm just going to draw a quick rough block. Uh, most of the artists, anybody who's looking at anything, will say do it in rules of thirds. So you have basically a top, a middle, and a bottom. Uh, for one is odd numbers are appealing. If you ever look at wheels, 
they all have five spokes. Some will have six, some will have eight, and they're not as appealing, but you notice more of the car designs, odd numbers, odd numbers always rule. It's just, it, uh, you're not looking for that direct symmetry that you get from having even numbers. So you would take and divide your pepper mill, say in half, and, and consider the top being the top third and the bottom half. So I'll just rough something out, but you can create a design then that will give you something that will fit in that block and just create whatever you want. I'll just do some flowing curves and then maybe a top. It doesn't have to be a round top. It could be oblong. It could be, you know, a straight up top. But it gives you some ideas when you're thinking about things. So everything looks good in thirds when you think about that versus two halves. Talk about turning a multi-axis. And we're actually going to turn on four axes. And uh, I'll send a couple samples around so you can see how this is done. Um, one of the things you have to think about is having a reference point. And I don't know if anybody can see what I'm up here or on your lathe. There's a couple ways I'll, I'll do it perfect. I'm going to show this because if you don't have a fixture, which I do here, you have to have a permanent fixed reference point. So I'm just going to throw this up so you can see how I can do it. If, uh, if I didn't have a permanent fixed reference point and I wanted to use a tool rest, I've got my tool rest here. And what you can do is, to create your fixed reference points, you might want to create a series of ticks. And you can use a, I'm just going to do them by hand, but you could lay them out by a ruler. It uh, gives you much more accuracy. And what that's going to help you do is, once you have this set in place when you're spinning, you cannot move your tool rest any longer. So you got to size your tool rest long enough to do that portion where you want to test to do all three sides. Um, and then what you can do on top of that, uh, let's see, what I usually had been doing, just a, a simple thing is you can have a series of popsicle sticks. It's nice to have a little bit of a round top on here. And what you can do is then you can decide I want to be either the left side always of that tick mark or the right side of that tick mark. And that will be your reference point. And then you'll put a mark on your line that says that goes with point one a new mark that might go with point two farther in. That way then as you're turning each side you can do it. Well, the beauty about turning on a lathe when you're turning just in one axis, whatever you turn on the front side is equal to the back side. But as soon as you're on a multi-axis, everything loses your frame of reference within to the device that you're doing because you're no longer turning you're turning to a center line, but you're not easily able to measure to that center line because as when I start to turn this back side, this side is already changed in reference uh, and not uniformly. So that's what I'm trying to point out on that. When I started turning more pepper mills, I decided I needed a faster way to do references. So I created a jig. Um, again, you can see where it's stacked up a few times. The first time I started doing it on a 12-inch lathe, I've moved up to a... 20 inch lays now and then I had a block for here for uh, the uh, 24 inch at this point so I can basically be in line, it doesn't have to be exact but very close to in line with your center plane and parallel to it so that way I know when I bring something in I can do it on the jig. But again it was just a simple homemade jig and what this allowed me to do was uh, I can, let's see, I can see here is uh, I just basically bought very inexpensively a number of, uh, what we'll call it, uh, stop rings on here. And you can put them on there and then basically you just you snug them down a little bit. They don't have to be tight because otherwise you'll be clamping onto the wood too much. And what allows me to slide them in and out and very closely to do it. And I just noticed even this one's a little loose so I'll just show you. I have on the side I always keep my little extra Allen wrench there so if I need to snug one up I can have it and then they slide in and out. And why it's important to slide in and out is you need to be able to keep these out of the way when you're turning and then bring them up in the front. And the other reason why I use fairly thin things is once in a while you may forget and when that comes around you have replacements always at the side so I'll leave it at that. When you're turning offset a lot of times you can't move your tool rest in because you're always having 
the opposite piece coming in the way. So if I'm turning uh, a piece of wood, uh, I'm always going to have a high spot coming in. So it's going to stop your tool rest from ever being able to move in. So anybody that's new on this, typically they say keep your tool rest within a half inch of that edge. What I've done here, uh, just to speed it up, I did Basically, I just rounded out, took a blank. You can pick any blank you want, uh, rounded out. It's probably about 12 inches long. Uh, two things you got to do when you're thinking about design, count for this spigot that's here. So as you can see where I've designed this in, again, this is where having done this on paper, you can explain it. Now that I've got this top, see is what I've done is I took that piece of paper, I copied it, and what I do, I cut out the spigot and then re-glued it to a piece of paper so I could see exactly how much wood I need. So when I'm using this template and laying out something, you can see I've actually taken the top, I've lifted it off of there so I account for that spigot and the cutout for that spigot if you want to use that in that piece of wood. So that's something for somebody that's new to think about. It's not just the pepper mill at the finish point. You've got to think about all how it goes together and comes apart. Okay, there we go. And you can see I've got the hole and I've got the spigot, so these go together. And basically, they're going to go together, and these are tight fit. I mean, tight fit, usually a, a wood mallet. I'm going to knock these together, and I'll get something that looks like this. It's got a slight hole in the middle. The two are two separate pieces. But why it's a tight, and when I say tight fit, this is not going to come apart. It's because I'm turning the forces on the wood and the revolute in re and the turning force is I don't want the wood to shift or turn at all within the center point because I'm putting pressure on opposite angles. And you can have a slight gap. Uh, I know I checked it with a light. Uh, it's tight here so that the wood can't rock as well. I mean, perfectly airtight would be nice, but don't always get to do that. And I'll index 120 degrees each one on those lines. So I've got that index line. So I've got one, two, and a third line. And what we'll do with that then, I'm going to take then with my center points each end, I'm going to, this will be done by hand, but I'm going to draw basically a line through the center to each of those index lines, and you're just going to look, you can eyeball it. So you have one like that, so you got three points on the top and on the bottom. You'll have that. And then the other part is you have to decide how far off you want your offset um, in, within range. So. I've drawn a line, it's probably about an inch, I'm going to say maybe an inch, a little bit more than that, that's offset. And with the compass, basically I've created three center points on each end. That's how you get your 120 degrees of shift. The question was, is, are the offset center points in line with each other? And yes, you're, this is, I'm, I'm going to call it my red dot, I've got a black dot and a white dot, just so I can color code these. You can number them. See on this one, I've got my whites here on this side, and as I follow this line across, so what I've done is I've offset it by 30 de or by 120 degrees, one third of a turn, and I'm on the next line. And then you'll take and I'll go with my black, draw it across the line, and then rotate it again, 120, and then you can put your red dot. So now I know once I'm ready to turn, I'll always have these offset. When you're doing these, because later on we're going to be at a point where I'm going to be way off on the outer edge, you want to, I'll say what you call, press in your indicators right away. So you can see where I've pressed these all in. And I'll just as a sample, you can see this one. But as you see later on, is you're, you're starting to take your wood away from the edge. So now it's becoming very thin. And we want to be sure that we're uh, not trying to press in at that point because you're going to crack the wood. At that point, you've pretty much ruined the project. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll press these all in now, and I'm going to press them in nice and tight. It's not going to hurt the wood at this point. And it'll give a good grip to be sure we've got this. So I've got the one, and we'll just rotate them around until we get them all pressed in. Step center, thank you. Uh, and, and that helps, uh, I believe it just seems to help grab the wood a little better than the four prong in doing it. Uh, a small four prong bit would probably work exceptionally well, uh, but 
the step seems to be doing good, so I've stayed with that one for this. I'm making sure I'm pretty square on the lathe ways because uh, this way then I can tell I'm close and a little too tight on the front. This gives me a point uh, where I can do it. And it looks pretty square. And you can really just, for anybody that's new, you can, if you want to check to see if you're fairly square to your ways, which are down here, I'm just taking my tool rest and eyeballing right down and say, can I see a straight line if I look straight over the edge and I see the way down at the bottom? And that gives me an idea I'm square to the, to the lathe. And again, always check this. Uh, and now, one of the things I'll, I'll get on, because I think everybody needs to talk about it, is safety. Safety glasses, um, always important. It's very nice we have a shield here. Um, turn with a safety shield, uh, that's always important, especially anybody new, any time a piece of wood can break. Uh, you never know what's on the inside while you're turning it, uh, especially if I'm doing something on an angle. Um, it, uh, Typically, it'll turn these at high speeds just because the faster the wood comes around because you're turning air and wood, uh, it's easier to see what's going on. So again, safety is very important. Um, I don't use this at home. I use a full face respirator mask uh, because I'm also using a, a independent air supply. Um, this is all dry wood. You're creating very fine dust even while you're doing this, but uh, I just decided to get in the habit, stay in the habit of turning wood. And the other part is keeping the other articles of clothing away from the lathe for turning things. Somebody that's young. I always roll my sleeves up. I do like to rest my arm on here. If I'm turning something smooth, my arm is going to touch that thing just because it's comfortable. Um, I don't worry about it, but I don't want my clothing to touch that because it will grab it pretty quick. If anybody studies science later on, you're going to find out you're looking for that harmonic. So when you see a bad vibration, you might say, go through it pretty fast. Uh, and all of a sudden, now this will level out. I could probably go up and get to another harmonic. And again, I think on the cameras, you can see it's a pretty good idea how this is spinning. Now, it's the other thing is, for anybody new, especially the young guys, is you keep your hands behind the tool rest at all times with this because what you see there and there you can see how that's spinning in all different directions. Point always use the rheostat for your speed control to start and stop the lathe because that way you always know when you turn it back on or you're fairly assured when you turn it back on it's going to turn on at a slow speed. If something happens at a slow speed it's much safer than if it happens at a high speed versus using that. The wood turning side uh, I'm just using it basically it's a half inch I'll see where we're at it's a half inch uh, spindle gouge you can see here I'm going to say well why is that ground back uh, this this gouge is getting pretty well used I've had to grind this back so I have a flat spot I have a, a Tormex sharpening system not the Tormex sharpener but just I use their pieces so I need a flat spot to keep a constant reference um, and I'll probably grind this back maybe another inch or so as I go to uh, get the full use of this tool. But again, it's not going to affect the tool. The cutting edge is here. The sharper the tool, the much better it cuts. And, and again, it's where you're not sure if it's sharp enough, sharpen it some more. Uh, jigs are the easiest way to sharpen tools for anybody that's new. Think about that, uh, especially you will, you will get the same exact shape each time using a jig and as a result you take off a lot less metal each time. What I do is get through some of these harmonics to uh, get to a comfortable level and again you can see how everything sort of vibration the faster it goes the better to a point. Um, what you see is and it's catching in there, you see a little stop action. I'm just feeling the, the, the lathe to see where's a comfort level that's not got a lot of vibration to it. Um, so I get it. I am getting a little bit of vibration. I can feel it. Um, when you turn it, you're going to see it in your finished product. In here, about the middle of that, is about where I want my center point to be. So I'm just going to start turning down a little bit, and then we'll stop a few times and you can get an idea of what we're doing. 
But again, this anchor bevel pivot is something to remember the ABCs. You want your anchor point first for your tool. Uh, I anchor it two points. Most everybody would do it too. I anchor it first on the tool rest and then also down low so I have more control. So I'm going to rest it down low on my hip and then you're going to let the bevel come up and touch it. Now why even on this because it's not constant bevel contact it lets me know where the tool is and I can let the wood hit the bevel of the tool which is this rounded edge here not the cutting edge and then what I'll do is I'll slowly bring it up until I start to get a cut. So again it's an anchor and I can hear it, you can hear it. I'm not cutting, I'm just rubbing a little bit and I can tell that I need to raise my tool rest up just a hair because I'm way down low. A little bit of vibration but not terrible. And again, I've got my anchor, I've got my bevel hitting, you can hear it. And I'm just going to bring my back of my handle up and I'll just start cutting. And once you can, and again, for anybody new, you always cut downhill, which means you go from the outermost edge into the center on spindle turning. You always cut downhill, which means go from the big diameter to the small diameter. And you can see what I'm doing on that point. And the other part I'm watching is, I'm not actually watching what the tool is cutting. I'm watching this horizon, which is on the back edge here what I can see. I have a much better view of that. I know the tools where it's at but I can actually see the cut then because I'm not looking at a lot of reflection and light coming at me. Again you can see where I'm starting on the outer edge and working my way in. thing you'll notice when you're doing some things like that, the more you get to the center of the shrinking the diameter, the more your wood contact is there. So all of a sudden you'll find out you're getting less vibration because you're having more bevel to wood contact, which is important. I'm going to start taking my top down a little bit to get that. And there's just one of the reasons why you want to do it. I felt one piece break off, probably just a, a corner there. You always want that face mask just to protect from those bigger chunks that come off. Now I'm just going to stop so you can see a little bit about where we're at. Oops. What we've done so far, or what I've done so far, I've just basically cut this top edge. Uh, still got a little bit more to go here. I got there, and then I'm watching. Uh, one of the reasons also I didn't explain is we have these two outer edges here uh, on the blanks. It's probably easier to show it here on this one. Um, that's my reference point that I don't want to turn past. I might turn into it a little bit but not much farther because that's just an easy way to look at that. Uh, if you want some people will color it. I, I found coloring it didn't help me because it just becomes a blur then and I can't tell if I'm really cutting into it. But once I stop, I can tell that I need to be sure I'm not cutting too far beyond that. Otherwise, you'll lose your point of reference. And again, as you remove wood, you're changing that center of gravity and the balance on that. So over time, the vibrations are going to go down because it's going to become more uniform. But also, you'll be able to turn at different speeds to get a better balance, I'll say, of the, reducing the vibration. I'm going to come up fairly close to this end because this helps uh, get a little better. Uh, I'll do it usually, I'll do each side in at least two passes just to balance it out. And also I don't want to take too much off this front end because we're pushing on it and I want to make sure I keep as much wood there as possible to, to hold it on so that makes a big difference. But you can turn cups, you can turn other objects uh, even to practice on that are much 
simpler than trying to do a pepper mill at the same time just to get an idea how three different axes will inter intersect each other. And if you want to learn about multi-axis turning in detail, how they actually interrelate, I would suggest Barbara Dill is a very good website as well as a book. And she explains all kinds of unique things about different multi-axes, how they turn. So we're going to do I'll check this one's a little bit too deep, but it's not, not a big deal for a demo. Uh, and I'm looking how these are all lining up. So this tells me how close I am to depth. And again, I can feel it a little bit. This one's a little bit long. So if one's too deep, I'll just, once at a final height depth, I'll usually push that back because that really is just a quick indicator. I know, you know, don't turn in that area any longer. And again, we can come back to clean it up. Uh, this one probably needs a little bit more here. This guy needs a little bit more. So I'll use these just as point of reference. And these help quite a bit. And this guy needs a lot, so I can leave him deep because this will help point where I need to improve my, you know, change my depth of cut. This guy is not too bad off, so I'll take him back a little bit. And this guy, he's probably a little bit, needs to go back a little bit more. And once you get, again, these are just to help get a good reference where I want to be because as I start turning it, it's going to change again. And again, it's not to try and get it all at a finished depth the first pass around because we'll balance all three of them out. Like this, this back edge, I know I'm a little bit steep, so I can balance that out with the other one. So what I'm going to do at this point, this is a good stopping point for this particular side. I'm going to pull it out and we'll do the rotation. We'll see. I'll double check my color codes. So I am, let's see, I have black and red shows, so I'm green to green, so we should be good. And again, check it. I'm not moving my tool rest, so I know each time I shouldn't have any problem with that. And here is different things we can see. Oop, this guy wants to bounce around a little bit. I'll just push him back. And we're going to start anchor again. I get my bevel contact. I'm hitting. And now I can start to cut. And again, I'm taking fairly light cuts. Um, for the reason is that what I don't want to, I want to avoid any possibility of chip out from the corners because now we're cutting into the next part that's being cut. And uh, again, going with wood, air, wood, air, going too aggressively, you're going to chip out your piece because of a light cut. And again, for somebody that's new to wood turning, I'm always using my body. So I've got this down here on my hip. I always keep that down there, and I use I pretty much will lock my hips or twist my body versus my arms. You get a lot more control from using the ear, keeping it anchored well, um, and uh, it makes it a lot less tiring. But again, it's mainly for control of the tool. And again, it's not a lot of pressure onto the wood. It's just letting the wood come down onto the tool. And I've got an idea of where I want to be with the cut, so that's why I can move from both directions. It's a little bit too aggressive, so I'm just going to take a little bit less cut and start here and come back. Let's see. I'm using that. Now you can see we've got two edges here. Now I'll highlight something with a pencil because it will cut away. Right here, this is an area I have not cut yet. And we're fairly lined up. You can see I've got this edge. This is the previous cut. This is the new one. If, if you ever have a question, where am I cutting? There's a quick tool to do this. All right. I don't remember where I'm cutting. You want to know? You can just do that real quick. You can see where you're cutting. So if, you, if you're like, I'm lost, put your pencil there because all of a sudden you're going to see different marks and uh, it's a quick quick guide. It'll tell you where it's at. Use a pencil versus a marker 
Um, you can do the whole thing, and that way, if there's a piece you're trying to figure out, do I need to take a different angle off, or do I need to keep removing from this surface? Uh, let's go check these fingers real quick. Yeah, I've got a little bit of work here. How are we doing? This is a somewhat time-consuming process because you're going around quite a bit. Uh, i got a little bit more work here, but I can get the, the gist of this. And we still got to set up to cut our mill in this. If you're doing a, a nice uniform cut, you're going to see this line from this top as it spirals down and around it will look very uniform. If I have one, which I think was a sample one around, but if I had a sample and it's off, if you're off quite a bit in these areas, you're going to see it's either going to come in quite a ways into you or away from you. And then that's where the pencil helps figure out which piece of wood do I got to take off. Because you, you can start taking it off with your tool, but all of a sudden realize I'm taking off the wrong side. But this is a, a process where you have lots of starts and stops because it's a constant checking your work, checking your measurements. Uh, so it does take a little bit of time to do a particular offset turning like this. We've got one little spot i got to take down just a hair right in here. And you can see now, I'm going to draw a mark just to highlight it. This one is starting to shape up fairly nice at this point. Just, it's just luck of the draw sometimes, I say. But you can see, I'll see if I can highlight this line. Because uh, that's what you're trying to do is if imperfectly, if all these were exactly turned just right. I don't know, that line's pretty visible, somewhat visible. This line will be nice, uniform, and smooth. So, so what you're seeing now is it's, it's a, a almost a somewhat jagged line, and that's basically because of either tool bounce. Uh, I got a little ridges in here, which aren't as visible in this. They wanted to be red to red, and you should have an idea that I'm getting that. And a, a quick test. You can just put your pencil down and say, okay, I'm cutting nicely up here, and I'm cutting nicely up here with my draw and my lines. So now I can say, yep, that's the surface I want to be on. And this is where the free pressing the holes makes a big difference. You can see where now I'm getting thinner. I'm going to be snug, but not real tight on this. It's not going to come loose, but, but again, I don't want to over push so much pressure that I have a risk of cracking the wood right here. But again, you can see where I'm driving through it. I've still got some solid wood down in the bottom I'm driving through, but as we take this down, this is going to become less and less. So that's when you start taking that wood away towards the end because yeah, it's less forgiving at that point. And I can see a little more of the shape of this coming into where I want to be. Uh, you will get a lot more vibration as I'm getting into this thin area. I got probably about an inch and a half of the tool hanging over the tool rest, which is a fair amount. Uh, but again, the light cuts will help reduce that vibration just because it's hanging out that far. And anyone new to wood turning or relatively new, all my pressure on my right hand, my thumb, it's pushing straight down. It's not pushing the tool, it's just pushing straight down. Limits the vibration by holding the tool rest, the tool, excuse me, tight on the tool rest. So all the pressure in out, everything is other is controlled by my left hand. And if you're right-handed, you know, be just doing the opposite, left hand doing on that. I'm a left-handed. I, I turn both directions, but this time it's just easier. And again, I'm going to come in with a little bit lighter cuts because, again, I know I'm thin up on the top uh, by plan, so I'm not going to be as aggressive this time. We can see here one apiece. We can check to see how close we are. We're getting closer. This guy needs a little bit. This guy is good. This guy is not too bad. I said not too bad. These are a little bit back, but I realize I, I've got to bring them in a little bit for this particular piece of wood. Uh, could be just with the diameter. Um, because I know I got a piece here that's flat, and that I'm going to have to turn them all in. So what I'll do is I'll start to adjust these fingers in a little bit farther each to get that profile, and without getting too much. And then I know this center 
Okay, I can get a, this one's a little bit not as smooth as I'd like it uh, in a straight line. And that's what you get by getting the right two sets of turning stuff to overlap each other. Look at that. Let's take a quick drink here. Ed, you can line this up with a uh, in sanding process. I, I, I cheat a little bit sometimes if it's off just by rounding the edges up, but you still got to be fairly close. Uh, even this one's off. It's not a isosceles triangle by any means, but unless somebody's looking for that, you're not going to notice that. I'm just, I'm just guessing because I don't have any direct feedback on that, but again, it's not the speed that's important on this. It's getting it so it's running basically vibration free or minimal vibration. You're, it's offset. You're always going to have a little bit of, bit of vibration, a little bit of vibration on it, but uh, it's just the feel the tail stock, feel the head stock, and see when it's minimized. When you're doing your adjustments, as you can see, if I can highlight this line, rough, and then I'm going to do this one a little bit smoother. And then the third one. This might be able to see. You can see that line is not quite smooth. Uh, it, it, if, if once I've got these turned and balanced, I'll keep turning and balanced till that line is going to be, I'll say, nearly straight when you look down it. And that's what's appealing on this. When you get this kind of a shape, when you get these S patterns coming down it, it's not the appealing shape you want. You're going to want something that's going to be fairly, fairly smooth on there. And it, it will act. If I don't have this quite tuned right, my top's going to end up being out here someplace just a rough rounded triangle when I round it, I can't get that, I can't correct for that. So that's where the constant tuning to take off center. So I want to bring it back to center. Here's my center point if I put it that way. The same with the bottom. I'm going to end up with a shape about like this when I'm done at the bottom, just rounded. If I'm off, and I'm going to use red pen just because I like red. If I'm off and I don't have this just quite right, and say my lines are here, and I'll just do this for example. I'll just, these are going to be a little bit way off. If I'm way off, when I go back to redrill my center hole, and this is where it's really important, and it will really show up because, trust me, I've been there. When, when you drill that hole, the center, all of a sudden, your circle is going to look like this and I'm exaggerating this, but now I've cut into my outer edge. And when somebody looks at that engine, they all of a sudden says, you know, paper thin on the one side is paper thin, they're going to say, hmm, doesn't look so good anymore. It can be beautiful from that side, not visible, until they turn it upside down and look at the bottom and say, the center is no longer where the center should be. And it's not because the center is wrong, it's because I was not consistently referenced to my marking so that I just started shifting it. And that's the importance of using your popsicle sticks or a, 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 a non-moving reference, I guess, is the best way to say it. Um, the next process, what I would do, um, I, would, I would actually, I'll sand this when it's completed. Um, I'll sand it on here just like it is. Uh, I have not turned these yet. Um, I would come back and usually I'll just turn these with a skew uh, you can either do it on that. It, it is difficult, I'll, tell you, I'll say the least, it's very difficult to turn with a skew because you don't have constant bevel contact when you first start out. You're going to get the bouncing. It's really frustrating all of a sudden to get a catch with a skew when you're this level and all of a sudden you realize I got a, I got a nick down here. It's just a fine nick, but it's, it's done. I mean, it'll, it'll look bad. Uh, sometimes I've, I've taken them off and I've actually individually recentered the individual parts and come back with a uh, just with a uh, spindle gouge, fingernail gouge, and just come back in from the side because I have a lot more control than to try and worry about two bevels to hit, and I can control it that way. And just very light cuts, starting from the inner and working my way back till I got it uniform in the shape. When I'm looking at these points, I'm looking at the point and the top. When I have them there, when I turn it the next time, I want it to be lined up. 
or very close to it, so it's not noticeable. If your frame of reference is off from center on any of these, that's again this effect, you'll see that. And all of a sudden it'll look like, well, the top's not centered anymore. And that's because one of the sides is no longer there. So, And that's always one of the things I'll take the time to tune it to make it look so that they're uniform. Uh, it is the only way you can do it is while you're measuring it in here. So it's a trial. It's a not a. It's a measure, measure and cut, measure and cut. Make sure they're uniform and they line up. It's not. I'll say trial and error, but it does make for a very nice, aesthetically pleasing one. Um, if I point to these, I can see even this one's a little bit off. Not bad, but I'm here at a, probably about an eighth of an inch thickness on this edge, and I'm gonna guess I'm maybe close to a quarter of an inch thickness here. So even that little bit, when I'm even working on that, you can be off just a hair. You can't tell it until you drill that. And once you've drilled it, you've committed to that hole. So again, doing is I'm, I'm leaving this just a little bit outside the jaws. I'm bringing my jaws down the snug. I got this guy locked down. And what I'm gonna do is now, this will help ensure I'm centered is I'm going to drive him in with the tailstock and that way I know he's going to be, for the most part, he's going to be able to be centered on the when I'm drilling. And again, this one can be locked down. And what we'll do is we'll drill through this side. Um, you can drill all the way to the end on this. Um, one of the things are for somebody new, good something to explain. When you're drilling pepper mills, it's always a good practice to drill from the center points on both the top end and the bottom end. And why is that important? Uh, as drills age, people sharpen them. You don't sharpen them uniformly on each side. Also wood may have some soft spots in it. And it will cause that drill will find that softest, softest space or a sharper cutting edge will draw the bit towards that cutting just because it can. Uh, you might be lined up here and here. Just I'm just overdrawing this as being really bad, but nobody's gonna notice that those two didn't line up in there. It's a it's a simple technique. But for anybody who's ever made a pepper mill you figure that out or, or somebody will explain it to you, but that's the reason why they always say drill from each end. You always say, Well I could drill all the way through, but again, um, People don't look down the middle of it to see whether or not the two holes lined up as well, and it's a easy. And I'll show you what I use. Uh, we'll drill it in three stages. Basically, I'm going to drill a three-quarter inch hole. I'll drill through, uh, and then I'll drill a one and a half inch hole through, and then I'll drill the one inch hole. Most of the time, when I do my pepper mills, I'll drill a one inch hole. I use carbide drills versus the, the other kind, just because they last forever. I use a mill drill. It's purpose it's a special purpose cutter for the crush grind mills unless you're going to build a lot of them it's not worth the money but if you make a lot of them it makes a big difference uh, what it allows me to do is I can cut both the one and a half inch diameter hole and the one and three quarter inch hole simultaneously so it's a speed up process really what it does uh, these bits come out they're easy to sharpen usually I'll hone them every once in a while with a diamond hone a couple of times and then after maybe 15 pepper mills, I'll pull them out and actually grind them one more time and then reinsert them and uh, recalibrate them. Um, but again, if you're thinking about making lots of crushed grind mills, it's a, not a bad little investment. Again, rheostat, get your speed down. I just realized it because I was using the nice start and stop buttons on this because it ramps up and down. It starts it, but uh, we'll bring it on up. And again, you probably turn this at about a couple hundred RPMs. I'm going to go slow because, again, I know this bit's not real, real sharp. And the other part is, in this kind of a bit, generally everybody will say hang on to the bit because you can tell if it's shifting. You don't want it to rotate in the quill because it will, you know, eventually damage the quill. So it's always good to hold on to it. And again, I have to bring it in about, I say I'll drill in about three quarters of an inch. And now what we've got, that's really just your, I'll call it your space, just to get your fingers down in 
when you're trying to get the grind. That's really what this is, just a relief hole to do it. Um, these aren't too hot because I'm not doing it. Somebody that's new, these, this is very warm, not hot. Um, carbide ones don't even get warm. I mean, it may be warm after, if I'm cutting six inches, it will get warm, but that's what I liked about the carbide. I have to remember, I'm not using carbide cutters right at the moment. And... Now we can go up a little bit faster in the speed, and it's a little bit too much. With these kind of cutters, especially inch and a half, you don't want to go on a real high RPM. That's probably going a couple hundred RPM. And I got to watch from my. I'm going to go in two inches. There we go. And then we can go with that. And, and you can see a little bit of difference on what a carbide cutter looks like. It's, it's, it's actually common steel and then basically carbide braze to it. Uh, I've had these six years. I don't, I've never sharpened them. Uh, oh, one of those numbered, one of those numbered 100, 5, or 110. So probably quite a few. Yeah, I mean, I've got the bowls in between, but I've done about, I'd say, 80 pepper mills. And uh, I, if you're thinking of doing a lot, you can get these relatively inexpensive. For anybody that's new to it or hasn't done a lot, it's good to go in and do it in sections. Uh, one of the things are, as you're drilling the wood, you're heating the wood up, wood expands. Well, that means your center part contracts. So you get the drill bit too hot and the wood too warm, now you can't get your drill bit back out. And it's, that's no fun either trying to figure out how to get a drill bit out. This blank was not cut long enough, so there was no option of using a spigot on the top. So as a result, I'm taking the mechanism, and I'm going to mark exactly where the mechanism ends. And this will be the line on which I'll part the top off. Take my parting tool, come in very slowly, and we don't want to get any chip out if we can avoid it. Gradually we'll come in. You're spinning a little, you're hitting a little bit of air on the way in, but turn it off to see if your cut's nice and smooth. Bring in the tool rest and Turn it down to where you're hitting all wood and you're, you're well within the bounds, but don't go all the way through. To complete it, we'll get out our hand saw and saw the remainder of the way through. Don't worry too much about this particular cut because uh, if you're down under uh, 15 sixteenths of an inch, everything will be just fine for you and that'll all be turned off or I should say drilled off. Now that the top is parted from the bottom we can begin to drill. We'll mount the head top in a scroll chuck, center it up as best we can. And now I'm going to check the approximate depth I need for the uh, 15 16th to go in. Here is my reference from the manufacturer's instructions. Now with the lathe slowed down, we'll bring up the tail stock and hold the chuck and gradually. So we want to drill it to the inch and a quarter depth that was shown in the manufacturer's instructions. Now, with the depth finished, or at least where we're satisfied, I thought it would be clever to try and uh, cut the relief for the ears. And I went over and picked up a uh, Sorby tool that was made just for cutting a relief on threads and determined the depth marked it on the tool, brought over my tool rest, 
and decided to dig in there and try and cut that relief. It wasn't that successful. So the other option is clean up your edges, get it as nice and clean as you can, and just grind the ears off the top part of the grinder and epoxy it in when you're all ready. Now we've taken the base and brought it up so that we can drill. We're going to drill from both ends, so this first end decided it was probably wise to clean up the cut a little bit so that the drill when coming in wouldn't wander. Now, I know you would like to really see the adventure of doing all of this drilling. Unfortunately, someone is not accustomed to doing their own videos and stood in front of this the whole time it was being drilled. So as a result, I think about the best thing I can do here is to show you around the instructions that came with the uh, crush grind mechanism. This will show you the sizes of the drills, uh, where to drill them, and it also gives you instructions on using a jam chuck for your drilling when you turn it around. Uh, I resorted to a spigot jaw, and although I'd love to show it, uh, I don't have another blank ready. If you were like me and find out that your mechanism is too long, grind it down on your grinder to make it the right length. We want to thank Dirk for his demonstration, and we apologize that we lost the last part of the video. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.